Good morning, everyone. Call to order the meeting of the Transportation Infrastructure Committee. Is there anyone on the phone yet, Matt? Just a second. Okay. Just a speaker for item 17. And we'll go to the minutes of the meeting of September 2nd. Does anyone any make any modifications, corrections on our motion? I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Okay. <clears throat> All in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion is approved unanimously. Item two through 11 are consent items. Does anyone have any questions, comments they wanna make? If not, um, can I have a motion? I'll make a motion, but I do have one quick uh, comment. Um, I will move to approve the consent um, agenda, but I do wanna uh, thank Ray Dovalina for all his work on our small project assistant program that we do with Maricopa County. It's such a great program, and um, I thank him for all he does. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Motion carries unanimously. Takes us to item 12, I believe. That was for information only. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, no. Do you have any questions on 13 or 14? No. Or 15? No. No. Okay. 15 was on the agenda for Laura. She was big into the conversion to the LED light. We'll make sure we get a report to her. Patients to item 16, which is the capital I-10 West Light Rail Extension phase. Yes, Madam Chair, um, here to present on this item is Marcus Coleman, Light Rail Administrator, uh, as well as uh, joining us virtually, Darren Lozano with Valley Metro is going to be joining in in the presentation as well. So I'll kick it off to Marcus to get us started. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. Uh, thank you for having us here today. Um, <clears throat> we're coming today to request recommendation for council approval for a recommendation for the Capital I-10 West uh, project phase one. Um, as you are fully aware, last year, city staff, along with our partners at Valley Metro, were given the directive to do an evaluation of the Capital I-10 West project. Um, and we're coming back with a summary of that as well as a recommendation for the phase one piece of it. Um, we have Darren Lozano, a project manager with Valley Metro here today um, with us virtually. He will be giving us a presentation. Um, at, the at the end of the presentation, we'll be more than happy to take any questions that you may have. Um, with that. Okay. All right, thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee. On um, behalf of the project team, we really appreciate the opportunity to provide an update here, especially on this important uh, part of the project. I know Marcus will be driving the presentation here this morning. Uh, so just a reminder, uh, this morning we're here to talk about the, uh, uh, the Capital I-10 West extension, the approximate 11 mile extension heading west of downtown Phoenix. This map shows you generally where it's situated along uh, the I-10 corridor for the most part. Uh, with phase one here, uh, program for opening year 2024 and phase two, 2030. And I apologize, is anybody else hearing any feedback by chance? Or you can hear me clearly? I'll continue on. Again now. Uh, next slide, please, Marcus. The next slide is up, Darren. Oh, looks like it advanced uh, one additional one. Sorry, you can go back one. There you go. 
This is a zoomed in uh, map of the map purely had shown. And really what it wanted to show you here is a specific alignment that was approved by city, Phoenix City Council in 2012. Um, a reminder in 2016, as part of T2050, this project was actually split into two phases. With phase one, you see here on the right-hand side, established to the state capital from the current light rail line. And phase two, extending west of the state capital out to the 79th Avenue park and ride. And for the most part along that area, along I-17 to the west, or generally along Arizona Department of Transportation or ADOT right-of-way, there on the I-17 southbound frontage road, and along I-10 within the center median and then north of the freeway as we go past 43rd Avenue heading out west. Next slide, please. So about a year ago, uh, Phoenix, not a year and a half ago now, actually, Phoenix City Council provided specific direction toward Capital I-10 West. And really, a lot of it stemmed around re-engaging the public, especially considering the recommendation had not been made since about seven, year, seven years previous to this action. And so the ask was to develop some public meetings to really re-engage the project. But then also for part of phase two, we we're asked to look at some really specific actions, including looking at other types of transit types, looking at different types of funding options, engaging the West Valley cities, considering that we know that West Phoenix would certainly be um, operating and using this alignment, but also the West Valley cities as well. And then finally, actually looking at possibly extending the project to Desert Sky Mall. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the public outreach and, and a summary of that over the last year and a half. What you see here is basically the game plan that we put together um, stemming from that council directive. What we wanted to do at the starting point was to re-engage some of those stakeholders we worked with in the past and have them really help us determine who should we be meeting with the and what should the messaging be as we go to solicit input. And then as we turn to earlier this year, middle of this year, that's when we started to have our public outreach. And uh, now we're coming to you now with our actual recommendation. And as we started this directive action, what we did was we had some really focused meetings with representatives last year, two separate ones in fact, in July and November, with representatives from various city of Phoenix departments, knowing that there are all types of, of, of interests and, and specialties that they could bring to the table. And so you see a listing here, we work with community economic development, planning, transit and street transportation. And it really helped us as we tried to determine what are the different needs. So for example, working on the transit department, you know, how, what's the minimum late width you need to operate a bus and to have some type of passing lane? How about bike facilities, pedestrians? So that really helped us as we develop concepts. And then as you can see by that bottom summary here, we engaged, we had over 40 um, stakeholder meetings since the September of last year. And just a quick sampling uh, of some of those that we know are along the corridor included the ADOA, safety, JLBC, and Department of Transportation. Again, that's a small sampling of those that we met with along the corridor. So starting the very first time we went back out to the public in kind of a large, large capacity was January of this year. And so what we did is we held in-person meetings. And so we had three separate meetings, uh, two in the area, and then one uh, in the Maryville area as well. And as part of those meetings, what we wanted to do was really focus on specific information and gather really detailed information revolving around what did the public recall about the project and, and what are the thoughts as we advance it? We showed some uh, routing options for the phase one and I'll show, the, show you here those later and get, we solicited feedback on those. Um, we inquired about the phase two transit types and extension to Desert Sky Mall for phase two. And we presented and really wanted to uh, receive input on advancing the project to phase two. Again, noting that it was programmed as 2030, wanted to see if there's options to advance that. So now we turn to our spring and summer public meetings. Of course, with the onset of COVID, we had a change from the um, in-person meetings to our online meetings. So hopefully everybody on this call saw some of these advertised. So we had our online public meetings in the May, June timeframe. What this allowed us to do by going virtual was to actually host an online public meeting for five weeks. So we had all the information up on our website for five weeks, and we paired it with two separate live call-in sessions you see there in June 16th and June 20th. 
the 16th, I believe, was a Wednesday evening after work, and then the 20th was a Saturday mid-morning to hopefully really engage as many people as we could. Now, the difference between these public meetings and in January was, we again, we asked to get information about what people recalled about the project. We, by that time, had a leading concept for phase one. And so we wanted to get input on what the public felt about that leading option. And then again, we did inquire about uh, thoughts about a phase two transit type and the extension to Desert Sky Mall. So how were those online meetings uh, received? Well, as you can see here, we actually really did get excellent participation. Uh, we have had over 1,300 people actually log in and, um, and go onto the website and learn about the project. And during those live call-in sessions you see there, we had 40 people call into the first one. We had 17 people call into the second meeting. And one thing I really do want to point out on this slide here is we really listened to the public during those meetings. During that first call, there was a comment made that people wanted more information about those phase one concepts um, because we had shown it in January, but we had really been focused on the, on the leading concept for the next the summer, the spring meetings. And so what we did is by that Saturday meeting, and also online, we actually presented all of the phase one options that were presented in the past. So it was a really good good interaction between the public and how we uh, approached getting public, uh, public feedback. Next slide, please. So when it came to the actual feedback itself that we received, um, we had 334 people provide feedback, again, through those online public meetings in May and June. During the live call-in sessions you see there on the first call, we had 15 people provide uh, input and then 16 on that Saturday session. We had three call our community relations person directly to provide input. And the really big success out of this was posting the online survey and inquiring information uh, in, in that, that way. As you can see here, we had 300 uh, separate comments come in uh, through the online survey. So when it came to the feedback itself, um, some of the things we heard really are, are going to help us shape uh, this project as it advances. And when it came to the question about what are the thoughts about the phase two transit type, when we asked people directly, do you prefer a light rail option or some type of busway option? And what you're looking at here are the concepts that we presented to the public. We had 149 people respond to that question, with 75% stating that they preferred a light rail option, 60% preferring the busway, and 9% uh, saying either no preference or uh, neither option as part of that question. When it came to the Desert Sky Mall extension, again, kind of a one-sided answer here, but about 200 people responded to the, the question, should we extend the Desert Sky Mall? And as you see here, 77% felt that the extension to Desert Sky Mall would be a worthwhile component of the project whereas 14% felt uh, really neutral about the, this extension with only 9% feeling negative about it. And next slide, please. So now I wanna shift focus to the phase one recommendation. And a reminder that phase one really here, as you see on the map, is that extension between the um, existing light rail line on the right side that's indicated by the kind of the, the, the 90 degree um, yellow line here, showing the light rail line turning around cityscape. And then of course the state capital on the left side. So again, this was the route that was approved by council on, in 2012. And there was really opportunity to relook at this, uh, relook at this route for a couple of reasons. One, again, it had been about seven years since this concept was approved. And so we know there's been a lot of change in the downtown area. So it gave us a really good opportunity to relook at this. And then secondly, and one thing you'll notice here is a South Central extension is actually missing from this map. That's because in 2012, we didn't have as much planning as we have now. So of course that downtown hub, which I'm sure everybody's familiar with, changed the limits of our project. So it's a really good opportunity to re-examine the phase one concept. Next slide, please. And so what I'm gonna show you now are the different concepts that we had looked at um, as part of the phase one analysis over the last couple of years and presented to the public. And where we started was with a double track option along Washington Street here um, from Third Avenue up to the state capitol. And again, as we work through what are some of the issues in the downtown area, you know, one of the things that came up consistently was the constrained right of way along Washington Street. Um, we know Washington Street is a very prominent uh, thoroughfare in the downtown area. Uh, there's been a lot of work that had been done for the Centennial. We have some historic properties along the area. And so one of the challenges we saw with the Washington Double Street, the Washington Street double track was trying to fit in 
two lanes of light rail, traffic, bike, pedestrian became pretty challenging. And so then we turned to other options, including this concept A. And what concept A really did is it kind of flipped our locally preferred alternative. So instead of being double track on Jefferson, now we're two tracks on Washington. But again, the same issues we had with that single line in Washington, we now had west of 7th Avenue around to the Capitol. So then the natural progression became, well, how do we minimize those impacts on just one street, whether it be Washington or Jefferson? So we looked at how the light rail operates today, east of the Capitol on single track along Washington and Jefferson. And so we came up with this concept B, utilizing both Washington and Jefferson streets, which allowed us more flexibility by only having one track on one line, gave us more, move to, more room to move around that track to accommodate uh, the, the bus lanes, the bike lanes, and the traffic lanes. But again, the challenge here, as you can see, we're really pinched around that turn along Wesley Boulevard Park, just west of 15th Avenue. And so as we went through the analysis and work with stakeholders, we've come up with a concept that we really strongly believe solves a lot of the issues in the downtown area. And that's what you see here, this concept C. So the proposed uh, concept C would operate essentially single track loop option. So operating westbound on Washington from 3rd Avenue, around the state capitol, south on 18th Avenue, and then east on Jefferson Street. And one thing I do want to point out here is as you see those kind of uh, yellow tannish uh, circle areas, as we started the analysis, we wanted to look at potential station locations. And at the time we felt it could be reasonable to cite four different stations within this uh, phase one part of the project. So we'd like to recommend uh, concept C as our leading alternative. And really, when we looked at concept C compared to the options, it really outperformed the other options we looked at. In terms of transit ridership, now that we're on Washington and Jefferson Street, we're allowed we're actually capturing that ridership on two separate streets rather than just one. Um, we know there's economic development potential along Jefferson Street. So by keeping part of the project on Jefferson Street, we're in close proximity there. I mentioned some of the right-of-way constraints and historical cultural resources issues on Washington. And we really see the operation of the loop um, is better in terms of the operation itself compared to those other options that we had looked at. And then mobility, again, when we talk about trying to fit all those different things in the phase one area, the, the buses, the bikes, uh, pedestrian and traffic, concept C really was the best option out of the other compared to the others. When we, when we went out to the public, again, back in the spring, we did have Concept C as our leading alternative at that time, based on what we heard in the January public meetings and the technical analysis and talking to stakeholders. So we asked a really pointed question to the public, basically asking, how do you feel about the leading alternative route option? Of the 183 people that responded, 67% of the individuals responded, they felt positive about this as a leading alternative. 19% feeling neutral, and only 14% feeling negative about concept C. Now, you know, what we wanted to really do was for those people that had some type of adverse thoughts toward concept C, we wanted to know the why. You know, why were there any types of issues for concept C? And what we pointed out here are, are three responses that received directly. The first response related to, well, we feel like if you're on Washington and Jefferson Street, those tracks on Jefferson Street are a little further than Washington, so are you really serving the Woodland and Oakland neighborhoods? Another comment was, if you operate on both eastbound and westbound um, tracks, it could be a little confusing for riders by not having the tracks on, on a single lane. And then finally, uh, we received uh, comments about um, if we're moving the light rail track to do two different uh, streets, are we actually accommodating for traffic by going that route? And, I'll, and, I'll, um, and so one of the things on this slide here I want to mention is that, as I mentioned, we did have a concept we showed to the public back in uh, May and June, but we've since refined it for a couple of reasons. Um, remember, we had four different station locations at the time. Well, through additional technical analysis, um, one of the things we want to advance and look at is, does it make more sense to only have three stations in this kind of shorter one-mile segment of the project? So that's something to look at as we go in the future. And then secondly, 
you see this dashed line along 19th Avenue on the left side of the screen here. Our team and the city of Phoenix found out recently about a few weeks ago that the um, Arizona Department of Public Safety is conducting their own safety analysis right now of the project and how it um, could potentially impact the state capital area. And so we're working with their team. Um, their results are anticipated anytime now, actually. What we wanted to do was allow a little bit of flexibility to have this 19th Avenue as a potential option, um, just to make sure that we're aligned with the DPS. And again, we know we're in coordination with them and we'll um, uh, work, to, work to, to get the results of their information uh, very shortly incorporated into our recommendation here. And we have a lot of work to do. You know, this is kind of the first step in kind of revising that, that kind of thick line on the map to adopt a, a recommended concept. But as we go for, for, uh, further, we know we have all these different items that we're gonna really work with the community, uh, work with our project team to really look at the station locations, um, look at the alignment of the tracks, basically how should the tracks be located within uh, the Washington and Jefferson Street and 18th Avenue. Um, we know that each of the ends of lines of uh, Valley Metro projects have storage tracks. So where would those be best located uh, for this project? Uh, how the project is actually powered by these traction power substations, those will need to be sited within the area. So that's another component of the project. And then finally, and this is a really big topic as we go out to the public is how we incorporate um, all these amenities such as landscaping and bike, bicycle pedestrian infrastructure. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Marcus, who will conclude with the next steps in the uh, uh, recommend recommendation. So well, after today, um, hopefully we're successful with receiving your approval, we will move forward with receiving approval from the city council. Um, what that formal approval allows us to do is to engage with the public um, to start the environmental assessment uh, process for the print and also do the preliminary design. Um, through the environmental assessment process, uh, we'll be engaging with the community, uh, reviewing some of the elements that Darren spoke about earlier, and really refining that uh, design to a step to where we can continue to move forward with the FTA um, capital investment and grant program. Um, also, we'll continue to look at phase two of the project. Looking at phase two, there's still some uh, transportation uh, transit types that we still need to determine, the extension to the Desert Sky Mall. Um, as you saw, we uh, have received very favorable um, input on that extension, and so we want to make sure that we can clarify the needs of that extension, and then also uh, wrap up discussions with the West Valley Cities, knowing that what we do here in Phoenix is definitely critical to what the West Valley Cities uh, plan to do for their transit uh, planning in the future. Um, as part of actions that have taken place before today, on September 24th, uh, this item was taken to the CTC, where we received a nine to one approval vote um, for this to be recommended C to be recommended as the alternative for the locally preferred alternative um, for the Capital I-10 West project. And so with that, um, staff is coming to you today for this report to request that the TINI subcommittee com recommend approval to the city council to approve concept C, the 19th and 18th Avenue option, as the amended locally preferred alternative for phase one for the capital I-10 West project. If you have any questions, we'll be more than happy to answer those questions at this point. Vice Mayor, do you have questions? No, I don't, not for the moment. Everything looks great. Do you have a motion? Yeah, motion to approve. Okay. Councilwoman Stark, do you have any questions? Uh, no, I don't, and I second it. Thank you. Okay. I, I want to thank staff uh, for the presentation. It was very good. I'm very excited to see we're planning to get this going further west. So I concur. All in favor, please <laughs> say aye. Aye. <laughs> All right, I have Marcus, a unanimous right? approval. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. So Thank now you. Marcus can get back to work. <laughs> yes, I can. That's Thank right. you very much, right. Madam Chair, and members of the Senate. I'll take care of. <laughs> <laughs> it takes us to item 17 active transportation program update. Yes, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee, Keeney Knutson, Street Transportation Director 
is here along with Brianna Velez, Assistant Street Transportation Director, to present on this item. Keeney? Excuse me, Chairwoman. Welcome. Excuse me. Uh, give me my Chairwoman. table 10 set up here. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of uh, I'm sorry. Chairwoman Williams. Chairwoman. I believe that Councilwoman Pastor has joined us by phone. First? You want the speaker? Um, Chairwoman. Can you hear me? Is that Councilwoman Pastor? Yes, I just wanted to make sure that uh, you caught my vote for the oh. extension. I wasn't sure if you heard me or not. I did not, so thank you. Okay. You All right. Thanks. That. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we will now go item 17, Keeney. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the subcommittee. We're happy here today to be able to provide you an update on an active transportation program. Um, this program is uh, something that uh, has been an evolution for our department and for the city. Uh, as you have seen and, and you're well aware as different items we brought before you that uh, our program has evolved over a number of years and uh, now it encompasses more uh, multimodal um, opportunities, uh, not just to traditionally bicycling. We have uh, shared electric scooters. We have uh, other uh, shared uh, bike program. And we have a lot of different ways that we're approaching active transportation when it comes to our residents. And so this is really an evolution uh, for our city. Um, and we're not just talking about biking. We're also talking about walking and, and rolling and recreating on our city streets and in our public rights of way. And so we're happy to be able to provide an update today to talk a little bit about the, what we've been doing, uh, what we're currently doing, and how we uh, approach this going forward in the future. Uh, it really is a multifaceted approach. Uh, so we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, bike lanes and, and, and a lot of the different projects we've got going. But I did want to mention that uh, at the end, we will provide an update a little bit on our uh, electric scooter program, the shared program for downtown. Uh, and uh, I would note as well that we have on the agenda for next month's meeting a more uh, robust update about the shared electric scooter program. But uh, I'm going to allow uh, Brianna to uh, take it to give you the rest of the presentation here, but I'll stand by for any questions. Thank you, Kinney. Madam Chair and members of this subcommittee, today we're gonna to be talking about expanding the city's bicycle network. We're gonna be talking about the completed and future canal projects, which is our off-street um, active transportation network. I'm gonna be providing an update on the active transportation plan. I'm gonna be sharing with you the spring bicycle and pedestrian count information, as well as our bronze designation as a bicycle-friendly community and next steps. Streets is tasked with implementation of the T2050 goal of adding 1,080 bike lane miles over the 35-year period. This equates to 31 miles per year. The pavement maintenance program has been and will continue to be our greatest opportunity for increasing the number of bike lane miles. You will see that over the last four years, we have met or exceeded the goal of adding 31 bike lane miles per year. In fiscal year 20, we added 40 miles of new bike lanes, and in fiscal year 21, we have already added in close to eight bike lanes. Uh, miles of bike lane. We anticipate adding in about the same number of bike lane miles in fiscal year 21 as in fiscal year 20. The planning process for adding bike lanes happens closest to the current fiscal year. So although the future years show below the target, we do anticipate that the number of bike lane miles for future years will increase as we get closer to those actual years. The other opportunity that happens with our pavement maintenance program is the ability to narrow lanes to add in buffers to existing bike lanes. In fiscal year 20, Streets has added in bike lane buffers on 33 miles and plans to incorporate bike lane buffers on close to 60 miles of existing bike lanes from now to fiscal year 24. Streets is also focused on providing off-street transportation infrastructure utilizing our wonderful canal system. In February 2020, the city celebrated the completion of the 12-mile continuous multi-use path along the Grand Canal from I-17 to the Phoenix-Tempe border. The city has received a lot of praise and support for more canal projects. So we have partnered with SRP to use SRP aesthetic funds to design and construct more canal projects. 
One of those projects is the Grand Canal Phase 3 from 75th Avenue to 47th Avenue. Design will begin this fiscal year. Another project funded with SRP Aesthetic Funds is the Western Canal Phase 1. This is from 4th Avenue to 24th Street. Design will also begin this fiscal year. We do anticipate starting construction in early 2022 on both of these projects. This fall, streets will kick off the planning process for the Active Transportation Plan, which is an update to the 2014 Bicycle Master Plan. This will be a 12 to 18 month process and was partially funded through Maricopa Association of Governments grant funding. This update will focus on active transportation infrastructure, will, uh, will focus on policy and guideline changes, which will help lay out an approach to planning active transportation projects. This strategy is different than the 2014 plan, which focused primarily on identifying specific bicycle projects. Obviously, due to the pandemic, outreach looks very different these days as we've had to adapt and look for new ways to engage the public through virtual meetings. As we move forward with the active transportation plan and engaging the community, we will ensure that public outreach is innovative, equitable, and socially distanced. Streets has conducted spring and fall counts for biking and walking since 2017. The counts are conducted at 22 citywide locations, with four of those locations being primarily recreational. The most recent counts were conducted in April 2020. The April 2020 bicycle count showed a drastic increase in recreational bicycling for both weekend and weekdays. We also saw an increase in bicycling for non-recreational locations on the weekends. Similar to the bicycle counts, the April 2020 pedestrian counts showed a drastic increase in recreational walking for both weekends and weekdays. We also saw an increase in walking for non-recreational location on weekends. We did see a decrease in non-recreational walking on weekdays. In May, Phoenix was designated as a bronze level bicycle friendly community by the League of American Bicyclists. This designation is good for four years. The 2014 Bicycle Master Plan had identified an ambitious goal of reaching silver in 2024, gold in 2029, and platinum in 2034. To put this in perspective, Mesa is designated silver, Tempe and Scottsdale are gold, and Portland is platinum. Street's immediate focus is reaching a silver designation prior to 2024. So based on feedback from the League of American Bicyclists, we have developed a game plan to reach silver, which includes continue to expand the bicycle network, implement complete streets, adopt bike infrastructure design guidelines, add more bicycle parking, expand the bike safety education, adopt a comprehensive roadway safety plan, and identify bike ridership goals and conduct counts. So what are the next steps for active transportation? The department is focused on ongoing implementation of a, the, and expanding the bicycle network and building active transportation infrastructure. Continue to look for opportunities to provide buffered and protected bike lanes where feasible and appropriate. We're excited about the development of the active transportation plan that will drive policies and guidelines for future active transportation infrastructure. And continue to use the canal system to expand the off-street network of multi-use paths. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kini, who will provide a short update on the e-scooter pilot program. Thank you, Brianna. Uh, related to this e-scooter program, I, I wanted to provide a quick update that uh, our six month, our initial six month pilot program of the shared electric scooter uh, program in downtown went for, started in mid-September of 2019 and went through uh, mid-March of 2020. Uh, prior to uh, the pandemic setting in, uh, the City Council did authorize a six-month extension to that program. And uh, because of the pandemic, uh, scooter companies uh, pulled uh, and discontinued their operations for a period of time. Uh, we are happy to let you know that uh, starting on October 1st last week, uh, we, we restarted the program and the six-month six extension started on March 1st, uh, or I'm sorry, October 1st, and will continue through March 31st of 2021. Uh, so we will, as I mentioned before, we're going to have a much uh, more detailed uh, presentation about the scooter program and, and the six-month pilot that we did initially uh, at November's uh, subcommittee meeting. But we'll be more than happy to answer any questions about the presentation or anything else active transportation related. Anyone have any questions? Hearing none. 
I guess there are no questions. Hmm? Thank you. I'm surprised that bikes are back. Chairwoman. We do have one member of the public wishing to speak on this item. Uh, Ryan okay. Boyd. Mr. Boyd, are you on the line? On the phone? Yes, I am. We can hear you. Go ahead. Perfect. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair and Kim members of Council. Uh, my name is Ryan Boyd. I live in the uh, Oakland neighborhood and I am representing the Urban Phoenix Project today. And uh, I'm here just to really highlight some uh, disturbing facts that are the continued presence of Arizona as the fourth uh, most deadly pedestrians in the country, as well as the continued um, concerns that pedestrian and bicycle safety need to take a priority with the city council. Uh, I'd like to commend the staff on this the report and especially getting us up to getting to the silver level for the League of Bicyclists. And I think there's a lot of great things that we have on paper and on plan. The concern that we have as an urban change project is just that we would like to see the continued support by council uh, of the staff when we come forth when they come forth with these projects uh, because the pace of bicycle infrastructure frankly is a little bit slow compared to uh, others we have cities in our very region that are less resourced than us that have managed to get far more done and so we would hate for this active transportation program with all these really great lofty goals that I think a lot of people have really supported and really done a lot of great work on to be siloed off and then undermined by other decisions that are made out of just convenience. So with that in mind, we would truly uh, it, it, I urge you to back this plan and back the action when this comes through as a great example on uh, Roosevelt Street west of uh, Central Avenue to 7th Avenue. We had a huge um, discussion and debate uh, over a, a bike lane installation. And that's an installation that's really part of the urban core, part of, of the design of, of an interconnected uh, network. And so the, as much as we love having these plans, we wanna make sure that we don't have to fight tooth and nail every time we get through that. Thank you so much for your time and thank you so much for looking into this issue. Chair, Thank Chair you for your comments. I have I have a comment. Vice Mayor. Yeah, so I just want to thank Keeney and the staff for the for the great presentation and all the great work that you guys do um, day in and, and day out. I'm very excited um, to see the canal project extending out to the west side. I know that when we thought of when you guys thought about this, um, the pandemic was not here yet. And people were still using the gyms as as a resource for for activity. Um, and now I'm excited for us to be able to do some good work on the canal, so people can use them to run, people can use them to exercise. Um, given the times that we live in today, so I'm very excited and incredibly supportive of this. So thank all of you guys so much for the work that you guys are doing. Th thank you, Chair Bowman. We have any other comments? Hearing none, this is not for action. I believe you're going to bring it back. Okay. No further comments. We will go to the next item. Thank you, staff. As always, you did an excellent job. Next is the city management update. Yes, Madam Chair, members of the subcommittee here to present on this item is Ginger Spencer, the Public Works Director, along with Ray Dovalina, Assistant Public Works Director, and Elise Moore, Public Works Civil Engineer. I'll turn it over to Ginger. Thank you, Mario. And good morning, Chairwoman Williams and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for your ongoing support of the city's floodplain management plan. Thanks to your leadership, the city has one of the highest community rating system rankings in the nation, which gives Phoenix residents who live in a floodplain a 25% discount on their floodplain insurance policies. As Mario mentioned, I'm here today with Ray Dovalina, our Assistant Public Works Director and Floodplain Administrator for the city, and thank you for your recognition of his efforts earlier in the meeting today. 
and Elise Moore, who is our civil engineer three from our floodplain management team. Um, we're gonna discuss some administrative changes that are needed in the plan to maintain our ranking, but no action is required today, but we wanna start the process of updating our plan, seeking community input on the suggested changes that staff will have in just a moment, and return at a later date uh, to seek approval of recommended changes. And with that, I will turn it over to Ray Dovalina. Thank you, Ginger. Madam Chair and, and members of the subcommittee, uh, we're, we're providing the information about this update. And first of all, uh, with regards to the floodplain management plan, um, it was prepared back in 2015 and it was adopted by City Council in 2016. Um, this basically provides an overall uh, strategy for programs, projects, mitigation measures, as it's aiming to try to reduce um, basically flooding in the, in the future, and hopefully we don't have bad floodings uh, in the, in the uh, city of Phoenix. So this is an, just an outline of what we've done before, and then also some of the uh, things that we have to do as a community participating in the National Flood Insurance Program, and also another very important, as Ginger mentioned, the community rating system, which provides uh, uh, premium discounts to the, to the, mem to the um, residents of City of Phoenix that are purchasing uh, yearly flood insurance. So with that, I'm gonna pass it to Elise Moore, and she'll get, get into the presentation. Thank you, Ray. Madam Chair, members of the committee, th this slide shows what the CRS participation uh, gives our residents in discounts. The city of Phoenix is currently a class five, and as you can see, that gives us a 25% discount to residents on their insurance when they're in the special flood hazard area. You can see over the years, we've improved our rating, and so we're very happy to be at a class five at this time. The current floodplain management plan has a floodplain uh, committee element. We're recommending that we replace this element with some alternative activities that would still allow us to keep our rating at a class five. This, this describes some of the activities we're recommending. Uh, they would have more public information and more focus on flood damage reduction. They would emphasize the public outreach elements. So we're going to get some community feedback on this proposal through the local village planning committees. And then we will come back to this committee with an action item to revise the floodplain management plan. And with that, I'd like to turn it back to Ginger for any questions you may have. Thank you, Elise and Ray. So chairwoman and subcommittee members, um, again, we are asking to go out to seek um, community input um, on the recommended changes to the plan. Again, these are just administrative changes that are required. When the plan was originally approved, uh, it called for a floodplain committee, a, a citizen-led committee, uh, and that usually is done through a bond program. And so because we have not had a bond program since the plan was implemented, that's why we're coming forward and um, going to be recommending this change. So these are other activities that we can do so that we can maintain our community um, rating system ranking of number five, which I must say, um, there are only two other cities or counties in the nation that hi have a higher ranking or the same. And so with that, we'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Chairwoman. Vice Mayor. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Ginger, for that presentation. I think it's um, something that's overdue. Um, so I'm excited of seeing you guys come up with this. I think um, community input is incredibly important. So also um, curious to see what community has to say um, let us know if there's anything that we can do to be helpful with that process. I, I know that it's always important to making sure that we hear our constituents and we hear what the community has to say. Um, so whatever there is that you think anywhere where we can be helpful, let us know. And, and we want to make sure that people feel that their voices were heard and, and, and we're here to help. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. Madam Chair, this is Councilwoman Pastor. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay. 
Ginger, I have a question. Um, I appreciate the work that's, that's being done uh, since uh, we're, we're not there for a bond. Uh, my question is, when you go out to the committee community, are you going out to the community at first and asking regarding um, the types of flooding that happens when we have um, the major storms that we have and how the flooding is uh, impacting their homes? Or are you going out with a plan already and asking them, um, this is what we think, and then asking for their blessing of what uh, staff ha has put together? And the reason why I'm asking you this is because uh, in the Central City Corridor, uh, we were considered a flood plan at what, some one point. And then at a certain um, time, um, of, uh, it was voted on or it was looked at upon that we were no longer the fl a, a flood plan area. However, when it does rain, it floods and it floods home. And so the discussion within the central city area is if, do we get flood insurance or do we not get flood insurance? Because uh, it, the flooding still happens, even though on paper it says we're not a flood plain. Are we looking at all those types of types of areas? So Chairwoman Williams and Councilwoman Pastor, thank you for that question. Uh, and actually, it's a great suggestion. I think going into this, we were thinking that we were going to share the recommended changes to the plan, but I think it's a great idea for us to also seek input as we're going to each of the village planning committees and meeting with residents to see if they have any impact, um, what impact they've been having, as well as to see if they have any concerns as well. Um, we do have a normal process, and perhaps Ray can speak to this as well, where um, residents can communicate any concerns that, or questions they may have. Uh, if there's you. anything you'd like to add to that, Ray. Yes, uh, Ginger, thank you. Uh, Madam Chair and, and Councilwoman Pastor, we do have uh, active uh, work being done in coordination with the Flood Control District to address uh, what you're, you're bringing up about Central City. Uh, because of some of the rains that happened a couple of years ago, we requested and, and asked Flood Control District Maricopa County to help us on the Central City area. And so they're actively currently working on, on the study area as, as you've identified about the floodplain. There is a, a active floodplains um, that are being looked at as well as uh, the infrastructure that's been updated in the last uh, uh, 10, 15 years. The, the last study that was done for the Central City was done about 10 years ago, and so we're actively working on that. Second of all, uh, we do have an active uh, local drainage program that we do get, um, we do get calls uh, when, when storms are coming in, mainly when we have monsoons, so we do have an active program for that. Uh, it is limited with funding, uh, but we're actively looking at that and, and trying to address as much as we can with the funding that we have, but also leveraging with the uh, flood control district. Okay, okay. Thank you for the, thank you for the answer. That's all. Does anyone else have a question? Yeah. Councilwoman Stark. Yeah, I, one quick question. When do you think you'll come back to us after you've met with the public? How long do you think that process will be? Madam Chair and Councilwoman Stark, um, we believe uh, we'll, we'll start, uh, we're, we're, we're gonna have to work with the planning department looking at the village planning committees as well as right. other, other committees. So probably at the beginning of the year, sometime in the spring, so we can go through uh, the multitude of different uh, village planning committees and other potential other com um, committees or neighborhood, uh, neighborhoods that are out there. So probably um, sometime early next year in the springtime. Okay, great. Because I, 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 as you know, Ray, I have a list of, of neighborhoods who have concerns, uh, particularly because they're adjacent to a preserve where spider trails have occurred and um, Mother Nature has changed the course of, of flood control. So if we can get a list of those neighborhoods to you, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairwoman. Thank you. You're welcome.
I, I want to thank uh, Ginger and Ray and have worked very diligently on in my district on some flooding issues and have found some methodology to help the neighborhood. I know that you have, it takes a long time for a lot of these studies to get done, but I want you to know we are very appreciative and I'm very glad to hear you're going to have more public meetings to address many of the areas in the city. The construction, the new roads, even the light rail can have an impact on water flow. And so it's very important we continue to analyze and move forward with this. So thank you very much. Thank you. And, and Madam Chair, uh, for the next item, Ginger Spencer gets to stay here at the table for the next presentation uh, with, along with Joe Jadis, uh, Assistant Public Works well, we Director. Do like to grill. We like to grill Ginger. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mario. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Chairwoman Williams and yeah. subcommittee members. Um, I want to thank you uh, and the City Council for your leadership in February of this year to increase our solid waste rate, which had not been increased in nearly 11 years, so that we can continue recycling for Phoenix residents. I want to also thank you for your approval over a, about a year ago to accept a zero interest loan from the closed loop partners to make upgrades at our North Gateway Transfer Station material recovery facility, or as we refer to our MRF, which many of you, or actually which all of you have toured our MRFs. Um, and so we're here today to give you an update on the investment that was made at our North Gateway Transfer Station MRF. And so I'm here today with Joe Jadis, our Assistant Public Works Director over our solid waste area, and John Powell, who is Vice President with Closed Loop Partners. And John is joining us online today. And before we jump into the presentation, I'd just like to acknowledge some individuals who've worked on this project, um, starting with the members of our solid waste team, uh, which is led by Joe Jadis, as well as um, our deputy over our disposal and diversion division, who is Rick Peters, so I'd like to thank them and their team. I'd like to acknowledge Ron Gonin, who is the founder and CEO of Closed Loop Partners and his team. I also want to thank Denise Olson, who our CFO, who helped us with the financing on this project, as this was a new financing structure for the city. And I'd also like to acknowledge our MRF operator, Republic Services, who processes the recyclables and sells them on the market. And lastly, I'd like to acknowledge Felisa Washington Smith, our Assistant Public Works Director, our admin, fiscal, and procurement teams, and the law department for everyone for making this happen. And with that, I will turn it over to Joe. Thank you, Ginger. Good morning, Chairwoman, members of the subcommittee. So uh, in prior conversations with the subcommittee, we shared with you some of the infrastructure challenges at our two recycling facilities. And just to quickly recap those, um, we have some obsolete infrastructure. Either the equipment is just older and there's newer equipment available in the marketplace, or it's just beyond its useful life. We also have had an ongoing change in the composition stream. So where for many years, and our facilities were designed with a focus on newspapers being the dominant commodity in our stream. That has changed quite a bit, and we don't have as much newspaper these days. We're seeing the presence of more plastics and other types of commodities, and so we need our equipment to be adjusted to those changing streams. And then thirdly, more recently, we've had uh, changes in the market and market specifications required of the quality of the product that we sell into the marketplace. And we need to make sure we have infrastructure in place to be able to adjust to changing market specifications. To address those uh, infrastructure challenges, as Ginger mentioned, Mayor and Council approved us doing an investment, infrastructure investment at our one of our two facilities, our North facility. It was about a four and a half million dollar capital project with funding uh, from three different sources. Uh, we had a zero interest loan from closed loop fund that you authorized. 
Uh, we also had a million dollar investment from the city of Peoria. The city of Peoria is one of the IGA partners that delivers recyclables to the facility. And then the city of Phoenix covered the remaining portion. And we had three main objectives with the, um, this improvement. One, we wanted to improve our capture of recyclables going through the plant. We're really focused on making sure that everything that's recyclable coming through there is being captured and sold into the marketplace. Secondly, we wanted to make sure we could meet those new market specifications, be able to meet tighter specifications in the quality of that end product that we're making and selling. And third, we wanted to improve the operating efficiency of the facility and reduce the operating expenses for the facility. So now I'd like to uh, introduce uh, John Powell to speak for a moment from Closed Loop. Uh, John is a vice president where he leads investment for the Closed Loop Infrastructure Fund. He directs internal and external research and development. John has led more than 300 waste recycling and cir circular economy centered projects, including ours, and he's published numerous papers on the topic. John? Thanks, Joe. Um, so just a little background about, about what we do and what we're accomplishing at Closed Loop Partners. So we are investors in what we call the circular economy. And so I think uh, many, uh, many here today are familiar with uh, placing recyclables curbside and um, our line of sight um, is really looking far bigger at the entire system and making sure that the recycling system which has multiple multiple components that you see here that goes far beyond our households are all working and that everything is um, uh, every component of the system is made uh, economically whole. Uh, it's, it's, it's a very complex system. And so to that end, we are making uh, investments all across the system. And we do that through uh, our relationships and, and the experience and expertise of our team, which really spans finance expertise, um, waste guys like me, uh, and, and others that have been in the regulatory space to really weave all of these pieces together to create uh, successful outcomes. And so uh, within the closed loop partners, we've got multiple what we call our verticals where we're uh, targeting investments and making improvements in the circular economy in, in multiple areas. And so uh, as, as Joe mentioned, um, we have a, a project finance mechanism called our infrastructure fund in which we are uh, financing things like collection carts, and uh, vehicles to pick up recyclables and recycling facilities to separate materials better and create valuable commodities. And then uh, technologies and facilities that will buy those recyclables and remanufacture them into useful uh, products that are of high quality. Uh, we have a private equity fund where we're uh, purchasing and scaling very promising uh, kind of mid-range companies. And we have a venture fund in which we are making uh, high-risk investments in very promising uh, technologies that have the opportunity to really transform our recycling and material handling system uh, as we know it today. Um, and so the way that our infrastructure fund has set up, we've made uh, approximately 30 investments uh, since our founding in 2014. Uh, totaling tens of millions of dollars all across the U.S. in project types just like that, uh, which I've described. And, and, and really what's built into our DNA is increasing the amount of quality recyclables that's put into the system, um, create better outcomes at our separation facilities so that, again, we're creating very high purity materials to prepare them for end markets. And then, again, stimulating those end markets so that there's um, the proper value assigned to those recyclables, um, again, against the backdrop of making this entire system work. So the city of uh, Phoenix and, and working with the team has been uh, an absolute pleasure. It's a, it's a wonderful success story. And I, I know Joe's gonna get into some of the details as we go forward. Um, again, happy to be here uh, to speak with you today and, and certainly will be here uh, to support with any questions uh, on, uh, on this effort. John, thank you so much. Okay, so uh, let me share, let me take you to the MRF, on a, on a little tour of the MRF and, and show you some of the capital improvements we've made. So uh, a MRF is a very linear process and um, it's very important at the very early stages to have uh, good equipment in place to get great outcomes. And so we added a new piece of equipment called the drum feeder. This piece of equipment essentially ensures a continuous flow of material through the plant. And it also has the added benefit of breaking open bagged recyclables that often show up at our facility. This was a common problem that we had with our older material screens before the upgrade. These material screens just did not perform very well. And you can see one of the major challenges we had was plastic bags would continuously wrap the axles 
and reduce the performance and require the plant to be shut down for maintenance multiple times a day. The new screens perform much better and additionally they have anti-wrap screens so we don't have that plastic bag wrapping problem from a maintenance perspective. Optical sorting has been a, a, a growing technology and so we've made some investments in new optical sorting equipment at the facility. This particular new device is focused on paper. One of the great things about the optical sorting technology today is it can be programmed for different things and so it provides us flexibility. An additional new piece of equipment is a ballistic separator. This device helps us continue the sortation of containers from fibers. Again, con continuing that optical theme, we invested in a new uh, optical sorter focused on PET plastics. These are your water bottles, your soda bottles, uh, a very common plastic we're finding in our waste stream. This particular unit is rated to perform at a 95% or higher capture rate. So what did all these investments um, get us? We wanted to take a good look after uh, the investment and in the plant upgrade was completed la late last December. How has the first six months looked? I mentioned one of our metrics for success was uh, capturing more commodities that are coming through the facility. And so we've been able to measure that. You can see here uh, five different very important commodities that go through the facility and the increased capture rate um, with PET plastic bottles being the, the winner here at 70%, but you can see we've had some significant improvement. And in addition to this improved capture rate, we've also observed that the plant is operating at a higher speed, a capacity, so we're able to throughput more material in a shorter period of time, increasing its efficiency, uh, as well as its uh, decreased operating expenses. Then we want to take a look from a revenue perspective to see uh, how these infrastructure improvements are performing. So this chart uh, demonstrates from July of 2019 through July of 2020 um, our revenues. So the light blue bars are actual revenues of all commodity sales. You can see for July, August, and September of 2019, that was pre-upgrade. The October, November, December period, there's no data because the MRF was under construction then. And then the blue bars uh, going from January through July represent our revenue. The gray bars adjacent to the blue bars in the January through July of 2020 period represent our best estimate of what the revenue would have been had we not proceeded with the infrastructure improvements at that facility. The closed loop fund has been very generous in, in uh, making a no interest loan, but it, we still need to pay back the principal on that loan. And so th those payments will be made over five years at 600,000 per year. And we wanted to ensure that the additional revenues we were receiving from making this capital improvement would more than cover the costs of that. And so you can see here the green bars represent the revenue that we're anticipating and forecasting relative to the payback of that principal. So I want to pivot and give an update on the recycling market, but before I do that, uh, let me detour and just remind you that we have another recycling facility in, at our South Phoenix location at 27th Avenue. That particular facility is approaching 30 years of age, and much of that equipment has been there for 30 years of age, and so it, it does meet that definition of obsolete and in need of uh, a significant capital improvement. And so our plan is to come back to you in the next few months with a strategy for the 27th Avenue re recycling facility. And now I'll uh, give a quick market update on the recycled commodities. So this chart represents, uh, again, from that time period of July of 2019 through July of 2020, uh, about a year, a little over a year, uh, our sale price, and this is for the particular commodity of cardboard, because cardboard is one of our primary commodities. You'll notice there are three different lines on this chart. Uh, the, the lower line, the tan line, is uh, representative of the published average regional sale price during that time period. The gray line uh, in the middle of the chart represents the national average published rate. And then the blue line towards the top with the actual uh, sales prices per month indicated, 
represents our actual sales from the two Phoenix facilities during that same time period. And essentially what you can see is we've had a, a nice improvement in commodity sales for cardboard since uh, January of this year. We also wanted to take a look at uh, paper, one of our other um, significant commodities that we process through the plant. And so again, the same time period is represented on this chart. The same three, uh, two averages are represented and then Phoenix's actual sales are represented here as well. And so um, essentially we are forecasting uh, uh, an improved year this year in terms of our recycling revenue relative to where we were last year based on the commodity sales that we're seeing uh, thus far. And with that, I'll turn it back to Ginger. Thank you, Joe and John. Thank you, Joe and John, for that presentation. Um, again, Chairwoman Williams and um, subcommittee members, we just want to thank you again for your leadership. We get calls from cities across the nation, and we would not be in this position um, today if it weren't for your leadership and the actions and decisions that were made previously throughout the year so that we can continue to support recycling in Phoenix. And again, this not only benefits Phoenix, but it also benefits the other cities that we have partnerships with who bring their recyclables to us and pay for that as well and share in the revenue. And definitely, uh, we would not be here without the partnership and the funding from the Closed Loop Fund, as well as the investment from the city of Peoria. And with that, we'd be happy to take any questions. Ginger, I have a question. Is the recycle market better than it was a year or so ago? Is it, do we have new markets? So, Chairwoman Williams, that is a great question. Um, what I would say is we still have the restrictions in place that we did a year ago um, when we, um, when internationally the China Sword was put into effect. But as you can see from the presentation uh, that we gave today and the efforts of staff and the upgrade of this equipment, uh, we have actually been able to improve the quality of our recyclables and we've been able to improve the capture rate of our recyclables and so that's what you're seeing is a return on that investment and I don't know Joe if there's anything else you'd like to add to that or if I covered it <laughs> I, I can certainly add uh, chairwoman uh, we are seeing an improvement in the markets for uh, in particular cardboard and recite uh, I'm, I'm sorry cardboard and paper the other commodities, aluminum, et cetera, they, they've remained relatively steady throughout. Um, and, and we are seeing some international market demand outside of China starting to develop, uh, as well as uh, an improved domestic market for those commodities as well. So uh, the, the answer is yes, we're seeing an improved uh, recycling market today relative to a year ago, which was pretty much the bottom I've seen in my career uh, was, was probably last year. Well, that's good news. Yes, it's hope. Uh, do uh, any of the council members have questions? Not hearing any. Uh, I want to thank John for participating today, as well as Joe and Ginger. Um, I always appreciate your work, your creativity, and determination to make us the best in the nation. So, thank you all very much for what you do. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have any calls? We don't have anyone on the line to speak. I think Councilman Stark, did you want to talk? No, I'm fine. Okay. Thank you. And we're no one's on the phone, if I'm hearing correct? Yes, Chairwoman. Okay. In that case, uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you all for participating. Thank you.